All right, well, I'm very happy to be introducing the first panel. We've heard from speakers, and uh, now we get the really interactive part that comes with panels. Um, so a privilege to be the one to launch that off. And uh, this panel is on safe reusability. As has been said, everyone is part of a solution. And in addition to governments, we need to bring in input from community, academia, and entrepreneurs. And our panel reflects that. Their papers also reflect the key elements in terms of environmental sustainability and responsibility, that is reuse, recycle, and sustainable construction. So each speaker on this panel will have 10 minutes, that is 10 minutes, uh, to present their papers. And then we'll have questions at the end. So if you could think about your questions while they're speaking, but let them finish all three of the presentations before we go into the Q&A period, I'd appreciate that. So for our panelists, you can uh, speak from the podium or from your chair, whichever you feel most comfortable with, but we will be using a handheld microphone. Please hold it close to your mouth so that the people who are watching on Zoom can hear what you're saying. So um, with that, let me introduce our first uh, speaker, that's the uh, DC. Uh, that's Anna Carrasco and Stephanie Bugliani. They are presenting a you know, paper on sustainable construction. Anna is a former Elliott School of International Affairs student at George Washington University. She's a former panelist at this conference. Last year, she discussed existing international law regulating space and the most consequential implications of dual use technology for outer space and peaceful use, which would be very interesting as well. Currently, Anna is pursuing a position in international sure. institutions, including the IMF and World Bank, to gain experience in fostering international cooperation between public private partnerships. She wants to ultimately work in the space sector and transform this conference's ideas into reality, advancing international cooperation to ensure outer space is safe, secure, and sustainable use. Her co author is Stephanie Bogdanani. She is a former student at Western Michigan University, where she studied geochemistry. She's worked with the National Space Society, participated in NASA workforce programs at MCS and NTWEE, and served as the lead sponsorship chair for Sky and Crocker. Currently, she has just been accepted as a master's student in engineering and management at WM. So, say congratulations on that. You are your choice where you want to present. Okay, now it's on. First, thank you so much for having us. Uh, it's my second time here and I'm really grateful. Uh, in fact, I met Stephanie at this conference last year and that's uh, how I got, we got to collaborate. And I think that really embodies not only the spirit of this conference, but only also the spirit of the space industry and the topic that we will be discussing and um, deeping on uh, today, which is uh, 3D printing for sustainable lunar construction. Next slide, please. So uh, the way we divided uh, our uh, top topic today was uh, in three um, different modules. The first one is gonna be an overview of what 3D printing is, the main characteristics, the process, so that uh, we can get a clear understanding. The second one is the main characteristics where we will focus on some of the opportunities for the space industry. Next, we will cover the circular economy and how 3D printers and uh, can enforce this. Second, we will view two challenges. And lastly, we will provide a framework for international cooperation and bringing um, lunar construction into making that a reality. All right, so it brings us to our topic. What is 3D printing? I know a lot of us just use that as a buzzword, so we're gonna talk about it. So 3D printing is a fancy term we use called additive manufacturing. Um, we'll look at traditional manufacturing for a second. So traditional manufacturing is a fancy term for um, subtractive manufacturing. So think like we have a block of material and then we're gonna uh, erase some of it and, uh, with like CNC machines and tool dies, we're gonna take away from it. 3D printing instead uh, adds layers on top of it to make new material. So how do we do this? So we develop or design something in CAD, some software, or you can digitally scan it. And then we'll convert it into a printable format 
typically the main common one is STL, but there are other kind of ones. And then we will go use a program and slice it and generate it to G code. And then we export the code to a machine and we will then 3D print that on the surface of the moon and then print the object. All right, can we go to the next slide? All right, so opportunities with this. So we would be 3D printing on the surface of the moon using a lunar regolith specifically for uh, concrete. So we would take the regolith that is there, extract all the minerals from it. And then from that, we would be able to do different kinds of formulas of construction or concrete for construction. And then we would be able to quickly do different designs with that, work with different teams. And so our opportunities with this is a one, um, for simplification, we have a one formula supply chain. So instead of having to need materials from elsewhere, we could all just find it at one spot. And then we have our self-replication. So it's a necessary part. So it increases accessibility and delocalization. So a big issue with our supply chain we had when COVID hit, um, you were getting parts from all over the different parts of the country for construction. So if you were to do 3D printing and use all the materials from one area, you wouldn't have any supply chain issues. Um, so for scaling, so 3D printing is smaller facility necessary than actual construction. So you're able to pick it up and move it from one place to another place um, very quickly. Um, and that brings us on to on demand. So it blurs the lines between manufacturing and consumers. So a consumer is able to request at, at, um, for 3D printing, say, hey, we need to design X, Y, and Z on the surface of the moon. And we're able to test the different constraints and um, supplies that we have. So one of the issues that they have with the lunar regolith that they've done testing was, is it held up under tension, but not compression. So we are able to manipulate the formula of concrete and be able to test it. So different consumers will be able to test it and we're going to do for mass um, production to mass uh, customization. And then we can improve the prototypes. And then you have the localized uh, production with in suit resource. So I know today a couple of people have discussed the circular economy, but what would be the role of 3D printing in the space industry? Well, uh, there's a couple of things that 3D printing brings to the table uh, for space companies. The first one uh, is the opportunity to advance and make better uh, materials. Currently, uh, they are mainly focusing on using lunar regolith. However, as research and companies based on uh, producing materials um, become, you know, and mature that technology, the possibilities will be unlimited. Maybe we're uh, speaking of having ceramics that can, with pressure, uh, produce energy or uh, materials that can keep the heat, which will be very useful for the lunar, given the extreme variations in the weather. Uh, it also, uh, since it will be produced locally, it produces uh, less uh, CO2 emissions, and it also uh, has a reduced demand for raw materials. Then the design, as Stephanie uh, discussed previously, uh, it, it makes uh, manufacturers maybe make one design that they can easily customize and adjust. They can also use uh, current technologies uh, to visualize it. And so that prevents lots of errors. So it's a constant learning process. Uh, the next one without zero, with zero waste, it's manufacturing. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, so it produces a uh, low carbon uh, supply. Um, and it's automated. So uh, in the construction sector, there's a lot of uh, incidents with labor. And I cannot even imagine what that will look like uh, for the moon. So this will really, using uh, the existing roads, it will minimize that. And also, it will use fewer resources. And lastly, uh, the product, it will constant uh, be improving the products they can uh, become reused, repair, remanufacture, refurbish. Um, then on the middle, what we discussed were the uh, kind of uh, byproducts that could also affect uh, the economy of Earth. 
in a really positive way. For example, affordable housing, since uh, this construction will produce um, and use materials locally that could maybe mean um, constructing in very difficult environments or in very efficient ways without um, harming the environment. Next slide, please. What are some challenges? Well, the first one is embedded in the technology. Uh, it has to do with variations in materials. A way to fix that would be to create uh, material properties databases, and that would, could also be a way where uh, different sectors, uh, let it be the private sector, public, uh, could cooperate in that sense. The variations in machines, different manufacturers, uh, they set up the position maybe or uh, other systems differently and the uh, difficult regulations agencies, or uh, it could maybe translate into having a different product. And then lastly, uh, the variations in the process, meaning the temperature, powder that is used, all the amounts. Uh, what we thought about, like how to fix that, could be maybe using QR codes to monitor when machines are manufacturing and just um, going out of their way for the performance benchmarks. And then obviously uh, this happens with many uh, technology um, using space, it has a dual purpose use and um, two of the implications we're at, which are like very serious is the first one with its proliferation. Uh, it could be away from rogue countries or countries that are not um, conforming to international law to circumvent sanctions or export controls. And the second way it could be or mean uh, the possibility of printing uh, on-demand weapons, which has already happened. Uh, luckily, Congress uh, has that bill, HR 3265, uh, that kind of regulates that in the United States. It's not the same in other countries. And then the second issue is that because 3D printers are connected to the internet, then it ha they have a lot of vulnerabilities, right? So uh, that's gonna imply cybersecurity issues, uh, maybe espionage, it has already happened, uh, sabotage, maybe just trying to make the manufacturer, uh, you know, by changing parameters, uh, produce another product or one that will not be, uh, you know, useful. And then the last one, intellectual property rights. Uh, it has a um, dual channel that can kind of uh, allow people to reverse engineer. And the way to stop that would be uh, with blockchain technology. Uh, last slide, please. And so our framework would be uh, international cooperation between the different sectors, uh, ideally multilateral institutions would advance in consensus some norms that then the public sector and the private one could uh, conform to and also agree and also um, kind of like cooperation between uh, partnerships in the public and private, just like NASA is doing with ICON. Um, and that'll be our presentation. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right, our next speaker is Jacob Bouchard. His paper is on on orbit recycling. He is a citizen scientist who brings his background from outside of the academic community using innovative sources to inform his work and is representative of our community involvement. So we're very interested to hear about your paper. Thank you. Uh, apologies, this is a bit new and overwhelming. Hi, folks. My name is Jacob Bouchard, as formerly stated. Special thanks to Andy Law for the Everyday Astronaut, Jake Minnan, and Raphael Mosley for proofreading this yesterday. Thank you, Ruth, and thank you, Alan, for putting this together. Thank you to the International Astronomical Society and the University of Austin, Texas for having me, and thank you all for listening. Well, the first step has been taken. Space recycling is no longer impossible. 
Let's shift the needle just a little further into probable. Then with enough interest, there'll be a budget that will grow and that needle will shift into definite. Let's get her done before physics dictates the budget for us and in a bad way. As you all probably know, According to astrophysicist John McDowell, human, humankind is likely to discover the natural capacity of near-Earth space the hard way. In 10 years, there might be as many as 100,000 operational satellites. Uh, he predicts that 100,000 is way more than can be operated safely. And frankly, 10 years is not enough time. Recycling space debris would provide the most effective long-term solution to the problem. It eliminates the problem as opposed to just mitigating its impacts. It is a solution with potential other benefits. Major investment in space recycling has a multitude of benefits. It fulfills the above objective of cleaning up space recycling while providing the opportunity for the birth of manufacturing industry and other in situ resource utilization projects. Humanity has an ever present garbage problem too. We hope the further investigation in space recycling can make a better world for everyone, not just us weird space nerds. Oh, there are several space recycling pro pro uh, proposals out there. This particular one is an unmanned automated orbital station positioned in a circular polar orbit at around 94 degrees at an inclination at about 900 kilometers. It fulfills many roles. The first step is a robotics bay. The robotics bay does not recycle. The robotics bay's only recycling purpose is disassembly. But it is also there for assembly and repair servicing. It fills many of the gaps created when the space shuttle was retired and opens a door to all sorts of new possibilities. It could be done easily. Well, easily at least compared to the second step. The second step is more about manufacturing and recycling. It focuses on the prior mentioned additive manufacturing process using mostly aluminum and plastic ground into powder as feedstock. Um, there was a thermal process as well. You can't do additive manufacturing without any thermal process, uh, but uh, the thermal process is used sparingly because there is no convective, no convective heat radiation in space. So you gotta, you can't just build a space furnace and melt the whole thing, but well, maybe you can, but uh, I can't. Um, it's complex, it's expensive. I suspect there's a positive ROI, but it is not guaranteed. The upside is that without the positive ROI, the effort is still worth the reward. Not all materials from the station will cost fuel for or require a salvage um, mission. In geostationary orbit, as you all know, satellites use the last 2% of their fuel to raise their orbit into a designated graveyard orbit. There is no low Earth orbit graveyard orbit because objects are deorbited instead, orbited instead. By establishing the station as a low Earth graveyard orbit destination, uh, we take control of the space to be currently in use. Uh, oops. Uh, we, uh, we get free returns essentially. Some things don't have to be salvaged, some things can come to us. Uh, the space this space recycling proposal is unmanned. There is no risk to human life. However, there are serious risks. The station will likely be in close proximity to the most dangerous space debris and will probably get hit a few times. There will be an extreme amount of docking and birthing maneuvers over the lifetime of the station. Something is bound to go wrong with some of them. Uh, for this reason, uh, the design of the station has all of the sensitive bits and positions, but they will be minimally affected by low speed collisions. With advanced notice, the station can rotate and absorb some damage from higher speed collisions as well. Uh, this is the only option for what I view uh, as something with positive side effects. There are other options. Most of the other uh, solutions are not easy to get funding for. It is hard to convince private industry to invest in a project that might not generate a positive revenue stream. There are several spacecraft that already have the ability to deorbit space debris. Astroscale's LZD is a good cost-effective solution. However, my favorite is not made for, uh, for space debris. It is the Northrop Grumman's MEV. 
It would be able to run several deorbiting movers in a single launch or deployed in low orbit. Um, and uh, hmm, well, it's uh, it was its launch. It's the only spacecraft I've ever seen where the launch window was pushed forward rather than backward. Uh, and there are a few of them in space already. Um, there's been a lot of recent talk about space lasers, which are usually thought of as a deterrent for other problems. However, there have been several proposed projects involving laser brooms, which can help eliminate the current space debris problem without expending valuable fuel. Uh, the takeaway here is that adaptability is key. It is a good idea to think of solutions that can fulfill several roles at once, space to be removable and something else. What else is this thing good at doing? Many of you are here doing your best to eliminate future space to be problems and mitigate the current ones. And I hope this helped inspire some new ideas about what can be done. All right, it looks like we have a little time left. Uh, I'll get a little bit into me. Uh, I saw the station and salvage vehicles in a dream in 2017. Uh, my main priority at the time was continuing to not be homeless. I had no idea what STEM was. My math skills were literally on a fifth grade level. You don't remember this stuff after you go through your life. You, you have to relearn. My writing skills weren't much better. And uh, the six years spent have been an amazing learning experience, and it's been a very long, strange trip. I had to literally relearn math, and relearn English, and so on and so forth to write this thing. I thought I was one of the first people to come up with this idea. As I look around this room of the ninth annual conference, I am sure there was people speaking about it since the first. Many people have come up with the concept. Many people have thought this through. Some of you are in this room. When the space, when the project finally goes into production, I doubt my name will be in the credits and that is okay. Space recycling is going to become cliche fast. And it's a very good thing. We're going to need all the help we can get. Much of the science fiction involving robots, automation, additive manufacturing, ion thrusters, artificial intelligence, et cetera, outlined in the original proposal out, um, exist now. When I wrote it, it was science fiction. Now it isn't. Um, it feels like this project was fast-tracked, even though everything developed was done so for other projects. Um, so that's great news. Uh, there's, there's crazy research being done and crazy uh, breakthroughs being done. And none of that has to do with space recycling at all. So that's about it, but I will find, end with one true story. Um, Ker Kerbal Space Program 2 was released on February 24th, last week. So I got home from work and I purchased the game and I, I needed to reset my Twitch password because, you know, hey, this is gonna be fun. Let's uh, do Kerbal Space Program too for, you know, and people can see me learn how to play the new version of the game. And I checked my email account because I needed the password. And uh, the second to top email was from Luke Stillwell. And uh, it said that uh, I'm a panelist here to talk about space recycling. It's like, okay, I guess I'm not going to play Kerbal, and I still haven't played the game. I, I can't wait. Um, um, but uh, it's a very strange experience to think you're going to be playing a space sim simulator and end up here talking instead. In fact, uh, if anybody's ever seen The Last Starfighter, it very much feels uh, a little bit like that. Um, and, uh, well, I guess that's about it. Thank you all for having me. Uh, if anybody's got any questions, I've got answers. Thank you. And, and our last panel is Philip uh, Camino. He attended graduate school at Aeronautics and Astronautics in the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, where he led a team of students in developing a prototype hopping vehicle for planetary surface exploration, including building and exercising flight hardware systems in Earth gravity and microgravity. He has experience in designing spacecraft for mission types, ranging from long duration human transit to remote sensing, and his side research interests in system architecture and human factors. In 2011, Philip was a member of the team of graduate students working on orbital debris mitigation, during which uh, effort the concept of orbital debris mitigation as an in-situ resource utilization project were first developed. 
He also has a background in educational and public outreach, including delivering a live lecture while on a field session at the Mars Desert Research Session Station in Utah. Did, did you say about that so much? Just a week. <laughs> and consulting as a technical expert for work in the theater and film. So um, you're interested in that very dynamic background. His paper is on mass reuse. So please look. Well, thank you. Hello, everyone. I have been at this conference a couple times in the past. I'm very glad to be back. Uh, thank you, Dr. Stillwell, for the panel. It's been very engaging so far. I'd like to say, uh, Anna and Stephanie, I think you guys did a great job focusing in on a place where it makes a lot of sense not to bring extra mass along. In fact, the lunar surface is the part of the trip down to the moon that you least want to drag mass because you've got the highest ratio. And uh, Jacob, I think uh, that was very interesting. And I think you did a good job focusing in on, on how Maybe a Leo graveyard, other than dropping into the atmosphere and letting it burn in, is actually something we should pay a little bit more attention to. Right? Interesting. All right. Well, the thing that I did, the thing that I'm going to talk about just briefly is uh, something that was actually done about a decade ago. So there was a, in the initial genesis of the concept centered around what if we could take all the mass that's in orbit right now and think of it as a resource, not as a problem. So we, we phrase it as, uh, Orbital debris removal as an in situ resource utilization problem. And where we ended up going with it was thinking about different ways you could actually use mass that's already on Mars. So you can refurbish it, you can go up to the spacecraft, recharge it, give it more fuel. Uh, MEV essentially does something a lot like this. You kind of strap on the back and push it around, and that's beneficial. You can take the mass that's already in orbit and you can move pieces of it. So you could say, cut off little subsystems. Suppose you launch something and you get a big hole in one of your panels, your solar panels. And Oh, it's a problem. You don't have the power you need anymore. What if you could go up to something else that's aged out, doesn't really use its panels anymore, um, out of propellant maybe, but its panels still work, and you could just sort of grab a panel off that, unplug it, plug it in yourself, and recover your power that way. I appreciate there's technological challenges, but it'd be nice to have a fully, you know, manufactured solar panel waiting for you on orbit to get to it. So that's a possibility. And then secondly, mass is mass. And if you've got mass, you got to throw it one direction, you can go the other direction, you can use the mass as propellant. And there's sort of a couple ways to do that. One of the ones that first came to mind was mass driving. So you go up to a spacecraft, you know, the derelict spacecraft, you connect to it some way, and then you give it a push in one direction, you go in the other direction. So you've just sort of raised your orbit a little bit and lowered its orbit. And if you did, my original thinking was if you did this right, You'd have a little bit of decrement in its uh, its altitude at the other end of its orbit. And if you did that enough times, you could sort of drop its orbit and have it spiral in from there. Of course, if you had something like a Leo graveyard, you could actually kick it down to a Leo graveyard if it were above it, and you could bounce up to the next thing. And this might be this might be one way to go after it. You could also do things like take the material that's on this this body, the sterilized object that you're working with, and you could see if you could turn that into some kind of chemical component. So there's been work done in the past on aluminum powder and water rocketry, as well as magnesium powder and, and, and water rocketry. So if the, if the basic, I'm not a propulsion expert, but if the basic reactions for the chemistry is there and you can access all this aluminum that's on a spacecraft, and as a rule of thumb, I think about 4% of a spacecraft can be expected to be aluminum. If you can access it, it's already fairly well refined, grind it down to a powder. You don't have to carry that propellant along with you. You can then use that propellant to move yourself along somewhere else. And then you're removing mass from the object that you're approaching. And one of the reasons we keep focusing on that, and if you look at other work that's been done on the debris problem, any big object in space is a source of future debris. And if you want to get rid of it the quickest, you want to approach not the little pieces of debris, the bullet sized things. You want to approach the big pieces, grab them, and get and deal with them first. Because every single uh, thing that's still a bunch of bullets stuck together that you deal with, that's all those future bullets you're getting rid of before they actually become dangerous bullets. Set a side side change, we won't go too far down that one. But so you have at least a couple paths to reuse potentially mass on orbit for your own purposes. And if you think about it, you might be able to do a very interesting thing where you find one object like a rocket body and you give it a push backwards, you go upward. And when you get to where you're going, um, the push you've given, you've given yourself puts you in a position to do RPO, running your proxy operations with the next one. And you could go through a chain of objects like this if you find them in place already. We actually originally uh, had some work done to look at these chains, and one of our one of the people on our team was able to pull together actual chains of, of delta bodies, delta rocket bodies in 98 degree inclination 
that were not really that far apart. So you could theoretically, with, with the with the concept that we were using, bounce from one to the next with minimal use of your own propellant while sending them further down. And you can extrapolate that to what if you had a chain of objects bouncing up while you're sending your debris down as you go. And you could eventually basically drop your debris to somewhere where it's less of an issue and you could get yourself up higher with minimal use of your propellant, which is interesting from a optimizing and an efficiency point of view. So there's a number of enabling technologies that would be involved here. You need to be able to capture things. You need to be able to do essentially on-orbit uh, construction and refining. Construction is to take pieces off, refining to do things like turn aluminum into aluminum powder. You need to have some knowledge of exotic propellants probably. So there, there are technology hurdles you want to go through, but none of it is necessarily very far from the current state of, of the art. Like this is all, this is not TRL1 from the technology point of view. There's actually one other enabling technology uh, that I wanted to point out real quick, which is a good space traffic management regime. So if you are down in Leo, especially if it's as crowded as it's probably going to be, you want to drop some of these uh, derelict objects, you are going to need to sort of send them down through probably more crowded orbits. And if you want to do that while you're going up, you almost definitely want to have a really good way to make sure you publish to everyone who might be close to your orbit. Not only yours and where you're going to be, but the debris object, the derelict object where it is and where it's going to be, and give them updates in case something goes wrong and they need to push. So, a really, truly well functioning global, ideally, fingers crossed, publishing all maneuver plans in advance to everybody, STM regime is another, I think, key enabling technology for, for this kind of concept. So, I can, I can dig into at some point with the questions where exactly we're thinking about things like this. But I'll just say we've been introducing some really interesting concepts so far in this panel. I just wanted to introduce this one and sort of put another thing out there to be considered. Thank you. And we will open it up to the floor for questions. And I'm hoping that you have them. If you don't, I'll do it. Yes, please. Yeah, to the uh, two researchers who presented on 3D printing. Did your research come up with the, uh, let's say, uh, one of the challenges that might be uh, arising with regard to liability? And so if you are uh, producing a new part or a replacement part, or the difference between a new part or some new piece of machinery and replacing a part, what happens if that 3D printed part fails? Who do you sue? Thank you for your question. That is uh, something we did not explore yet. Um, thank you for bringing it up because now we will definitely look at those implications. Um, our, or what I will ask myself is first off, uh, so is the person manufacturing the same, you know, the new part, the same one that manufactured? Because if so, yes, you know, and it's like a company you could like, you know, that company should be liable. But yeah, it's a really good question because it kind of blends, or as Stephanie pointed out, uh, one of the implications is that you could be like both consumer and producer, say is the astronaut, is the astronaut liable for that? It's really good question. And I don't have an answer yet. Thank you. More questions? Um, so the, 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 the reuse of objects in space, it's, I think it's fairly clear how um, any the mission extension vehicle does it. They're, they're actually utilizing new hardware to replace older subsystems like the energy control system and the, the fueling talent system. So that's, I think, a fairly well uh, established route. But if you're talking about disassembly and reuse of components um, in the real world, um, when you're integrating a spacecraft with components, you have typically somebody coming in from another institution, you have a, an ICD, you have uh, sustaining engineering, you have um, you have as-built drawings, um, these sorts of things. These, these won't exist when you're when you're doing this sort of thing. And and it's important to recognize that you just can't chop something off and expect it to work because you have uh, 
you have a, a wiring harness that we now have destroyed, um, and you have no good way to really do this robotically. So I'm just trying to get my head around how you imagine this could actually work in a practical sense. All right, thank you, Dr. Skinner. I'll summarize your question real quick. Uh, so that was, how do we deal with the practicalities of taking components from a derelict spacecraft and reusing them on a second spacecraft? Solar panels, yeah. That. Yeah, solar panel. And yes, so you, you, you said specifically that you were just probably going to destroy the wiring harness when you pull it off. And that's, that's probably true, unless you have specifically designed it to be modular. And in the, in the really grand scheme of things, that might be the case where you start to see modular systems, especially if you're talking about mass manufactured systems, you might be able to make a disconnect at one of the interfaces between uh, the modular component and the rest of the bus. I'm not going to say that's what we should rely on to start with. So one of the other key challenges is going to be finding the components that are easiest to reuse. So you might want to look for components that don't have a lot of interfaces with that simple ones, like say a structural member. If you, for some reason, felt like you needed the truss uh, and you could cut one end of the truss, cut the other end of the truss, and then clamp on to one end, then you have uh, started to solve that problem pretty straightforwardly. One component that actually came to mind when I thought about this, because you were, you're right, this is a huge amount of complicated things you have to deal with. And there's a couple of ways you can deal with that. But one component that you might think about using if you're looking for something straightforward is an RTG. And I'm not going to say there's any RTGs that are just floating around in Earth orbit right now. But if you happen to know of an RTG, then a radioisotope thermoelectric generator. So an RTG is a nuclear power source. Uh, basically, so it'll last a long time. It's not going to be a lot. It's not going to be heavily degraded from being in orbit. Solar panels will be degraded, so you might use them, you might not. But if there's an RTG. It's already far away from the rest of your body, out on an extension piece because you don't like the radiation. So if you go up, you find it, clip it off, and then you don't even have to use the original uh, pathway for the power or the, or the thermal energy, whatever it is. You can just sort of clamp a new one around. And I appreciate this is not under the zero level of manufacturing on orbit challenge, but this is something where you could start to think about dealing with challenges. There's some other enabling things like the increased capability of on-orbit robotics and teleoperation is probably another key enabler. 10 years ago, I don't know about you, but I wouldn't have thought that you could pull off what MEV pulled off. They managed to do it though. They had a remote operation connect in and start to do propulsion. That, that's pretty impressive. I'm not gonna say that I think it's totally impossible to do other operations, more complex operations in space sometime in the next 10 years. And secondly, this is a real wild card. You can think about, this is part of the original idea, you can think about flying humans on your, on your uh, vehicle to do this refurbishment. Because if you got humans, you can do all kinds of things you can't do automatically. That's probably not gonna be the path you take in the end. Um, for a lot of reasons. Number one, humans take up a lot more mass. But if you had a human operator physically on site, you can just sort of pull up to this thing, cut it off, put it together. You could have the human do some uh, new wiring for you. I, again, I'm not saying that's the solution at all, but if you want some wild cards, that's what I throw at you. Okay, so do you want to answer as well? Oh. I'm not sure if this is a great answer, but uh, at least in the project proposal, it meant building an absolutely massive, massive database of everything that you were recycling, everything that you were restoring, everything that you were looking at, and making sure that you walk into this with, that, with a full knowledge of how these things work before they enter the service bay, before you even take it, before the robot that makes its first cut or first anything. You have to have all of that information properly documented. I actually have a checklist somewhere here for everything that you need to go through before this thing even gets started. Um, it's not a great checklist. Uh, it's probably flawed, but uh, I certainly did take that into account. Uh, some things are easy, plastic and aluminum, easy. Uh, everything else, you're absolutely right. If you wanted, you can't just pull a solar panel off of a thing and then add it to the bottom. It's got a, its own power supply. It's got its own voltage, its own wattage, its own everything. You've got to uh, compensate for that and build in some sort of power management unit uh, that, would, uh, that would enable you to pull power off of this solar panel and put it into, you know, you know add it to the power source of the station or the spacecraft in question. So if I could follow on to Mark's question, 
You're talking about uh, identifying objects that are there now and how we can use them. What about the future? Is there a future where you design for recyclability that can be part of the sustainability paradigm? Or is that just, they're not going to do it? That would be fabulous, but uh, you know, you have to convince people to do it. I think there is. I think Lockheed Martin is, in fact, doing a lot of that already. Um, they've already started building in uh, not not recycling, but uh, a lot of people are now adding elements that would allow their satellites to be serviced. Um, and from there, you take it one more step, and that's how to and allow your satellites to be recycled easier. Yes, internet as well. I just say, I think you're exactly right about that. We would love it if that could happen. That would solve a lot of issues, but it's hard to guarantee it. The one thing that would make me cross my fingers for that actually occurring would be the more, I guess, economic activity that goes into the space sector in the first place. Uh, and the higher your, your margins get in the sector, the more room you have to start trying interesting things like that. So right at the point in time when activity starts to really explode is the point when you really want to start thinking about and kind of start to implement that if you really want to have. All the way in the back. So one of the problems that you run into with trying to trying to take a satellite apart in space is that you've got other little pieces that are going to 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 uh, nut the bolt or whatever rivet, whatever. And if you uh, start taking the satellite apart and the part gets away from you, you just you just increase the debris problem. You've got small pieces now, which which you know, are really worse than having big pieces that can be tracked. So I, that that's one of the problems that I see with with uh, uh, with recycling something in space, uh, and, and just how do you overcome something like that? Okay, so I'll summarize again real quick. When you are doing on orbit uh, deconstruction and reconstruction, you have a very high risk, if not certainty, of generating small fragments, either pieces that are already there, or even something like shavings, and those themselves are debris objects, which is which are things you do not want to produce if you could possibly get away with that. But I, yes, you are correct. I think one of the one of the first places to start thinking about how to do orbital debris removal is to ask yourself, how do I do this without generating more debris? And I, I really only see one answer that's an obvious answer, which is you make sure you somehow enclose the volume in which you're doing all this so that any debris that's generated is captured. So you, you need some way to sort of pop an enclosure around your working area. And while you make your cuts, anything that comes off or flies off is gonna be captured in there. Uh, something as simple as you know aerogel coach. I don't know exactly how you would pull this off, but you absolutely do not want to create debris, and that would be the most straightforward way to do it is put it inside an enclosure. Um, the other thing I would say here is this is one of the reasons why the original concept uh, focused a little bit more on, on mass driving entire systems. So we, the way we thought about it was you sort of put a collar up against the derelict object and a, a nice flat, hard surface, structural members behind it, and maybe you uh, retract it in with some, with some gears, and then you release and some springs push it off. Or the simplest mass driver you think you could possibly get away with. And one reason to mass drive a full object as an object is because you have a minimal risk, ideally, of generating debris when you do that. And I appreciate, again, it's really hard to drive that risk down to actually zero. So this is definitely something you want to do some testing on before you start to do it at scale. But yes, doing this in a way that minimizes or ideally completely eliminates risk of additional debris creation is, is one of the prime driving factors for the technology we're looking at. Uh, Ruth Stilwell's uh, favorite thing in the world are, are balloons. Lovely. And uh, with uh, what Astrophy does, their mining concepts for uh, asteroid mining, uh, the first thing they do is they enclose the asteroid in a balloon to make sure that they have the full, uh, they have the full scope of uh, of being able to do exactly what you just said and not have little bits flying off everywhere. Uh, in my particular case, the station is designed with something akin to a shuttle bay. It's got two big doors, two big bay doors. They open, the thing comes in, the doors close. The work goes on inside the shuttle bay type structure, not outside and exposed to the elements. Um, to, to make sure, absolutely ensure that that doesn't happen. Because of course, 
if a bolt flies out, you're going to see it in about 12 and a half minutes as it comes around the planet. And it's going to come right back at you. So, I'm sorry, we had a question up here. Um, I did want to know about space and recent safety. Uh, a follow up though, uh, what considerations have you made with respect to the legal aspect of cannibalizing uh, objects in space that may belong to, say, another nation and things like that? Well, that's a very good question. Uh, currently, the most space debris by the numbers is, in fact, Russian. And turning to the Russian government and saying, hey, we want your space debris, uh, they're probably going to say no. Uh, but um, even asking uh, would show a gesture of good faith that doesn't necessarily involve an escalation in terms of, uh, of war. Everything in space does belong to said entity, even if it's garbage. Um, and currently, the garbage is worth nothing. But as soon as the garbage becomes worth something, then you have to pay for it. That's an easy answer. So um, my my take would be yes. I'm not I'm not an expert on space law, but yes, that is a a notable obstacle. And the way you get around that is you get their permission first. It's called a contract. <laughs> contract. No, seriously. Ideally, yes. A contract would be a, the best way to do that. In fact, when we did the original work, um, what we pulled together was chains of objects. Um, we're gonna use, uh, so the first person to come up with one of these chains was Dr. Gwendolyn Gettner, who's now at MIT Lincoln Lab. So the first get lift chain she identified, she explicitly looked for objects that were physically reachable one to the next and all had the same launching state and were all the same class of objects. So they're all, I believe they're all Delta bodies, but she found a couple of different chains. So if, if you have the permission of everybody who's involved, then you get around that. And to be perfectly honest, I don't know a way to get around it that doesn't create some other legal issues other than that. And I, I appreciate you guys' enthusiasm and answers, but we did have several questions. So if we could take a few. So here with the uh, uh, idea about the closure. So, on, and just real quick on, on the current question, there are absolutely international legal principles that we could leverage to deal with dangerous objects, right? If it's, if it's going to crash in the International Space Station, we've got a justification to deal with it, even if it's labeled as somebody else. Um, with respect to the comment about enclosing an asteroid and mining it, we do have, uh, with respect to no claiming of territory, some problems there, right? With the moon, it's pretty clear that with in-situ resource processing, extraction, and possession, that we can get to some sort of ability to own and sell those resources. But with respect to a, a, a small asteroid, even a micrometeorite is a celestial body under the trees. And if you totally convert as a legal principle, if you totally destroy that object, you have inherently claimed it entirely as your own. And so to take apart an entire asteroid for mining purposes does pose some potential legal challenges. I'd be curious um, to hear if anyone else has ideas on that. And do we have some other hands? It's a little hard to see with this lighting. Okay, go ahead. Do you have thoughts on, on their comment about the destruction of their celestial bodies as a potential problem? Hey, if you want to bring that into the short footprint, because that is mining for the resource that would be used for something else. Have you looked at that in your research as well? <laughs> All right. So the question, if I'm understanding right, was asking about the my implications on the can you just re-ask the question? Yeah, so in the effort to protect from creating additional debris, if you enclose an yeah. asteroid, for example, and then utilize all of those resources, have you not claimed sovereignty over a celestial body? Well, at what point does your use of resources on that body constitute a claim of ownership? Uh, we have not done the specific research on when that happens, but I think it would take a lot of committees to have different policy writers to come together and write policies for that because different um, countries are going to say different things on that. My personal opinion is once you mine it and you take it out, I believe that should be yours to like work with. 
but there's also a finite amount of resources. So people have to sit down and write policies for that. So I think uh, discussing this question, we should have two things in mind. The first one is the Outer Spheres Treaty, Article 9, which uh, phrases due regard. So uh, what that will make is people that are involving in that activity is that, you know, for example, you mining that asteroid, how is that gonna impact, say, another country, uh, say, the environment? So that's something that we should be uh, thinking about when trying to uh, come up with uh, regulatory or even trying to codify this question into a possible norm or like uh, when we are trying to incentivize behavior. Um, another thing is, well, some countries, the way they will get away with it is just, you know, you make or change your legal structure. And then yes, maybe you violate international law, but then you could technically engage in lawfare, which some countries will definitely do, uh, depending on their political system. So there is not a simple answer. So um, listening to your talk about a building on the moon, I, I thought of a good historical analog that you might want to explore a little bit. I think it really resonates. When people first came to this continent, whether they crossed the Bering Land Bridge or came on ships from Europe, there was no supply chain. They built out of wood, they built out of animal skins, they built out of sod, they made mud bricks. Um, so what you're doing is you're talking about building right to left. You're talking about mud bricks on the moon, basically. Yeah. So um, it's it's obviously something we've done and we have to do because you know, there's no other way in some of our history. Okay. Okay. Quick check to see if we have to evacuate or go. So Mark, there's this uh, this has yeah. been going on for a long time, and you're talking about mud bricks, but also like quarrying buildings to create other buildings. It's been a practice for millennia. So these sort of practices of a circular economy, we, we call it a circular economy now, but the idea has been in existence for a long time. So, um, so I'm going to ask you this question: Do we expect that practices supporting a circular economy in space will be implemented before or after? They're established in other similar economic sectors. Is space going to be first or last? Thank you. Um, neither. So, in, in fact, this is what I was thinking of when I said uh, the time to start to implement practices like that would support a circular economy is when you have a lot of margin in the system. So, if if everybody were if everybody were fully invested in space and it was a single industry that was most important to absolutely everybody in the world. Which is it's not bad. It is pretty important. But it's not bad. Um, then you would then you would expect it to have all kinds of other advancements appear in in that particular sector first. So if you're asking, should we expect to see circular uh, circular economic features implemented in space? I would say it won't be the first place to have them. There'll be places we can borrow from, other sectors we can draw from, and there'll be all kinds of other analogies and and past knowledge and. Uh, fields we can pull from to get into space. It won't be the last either. I, I think especially given how expensive it is to put NASA up in space and to do any kind of operation, you're going to want you're going to have a strong economic driver to do some level of, of circular economic practices on orbit. And in fact, the, the very existence of MEV and to uh, to an extent LCD D uh, indicates that I think so 10 years ago, 20 years ago, I don't know that anyone ever said, yeah, we'll, we'll see people using spacecraft. There were all kinds of concepts where there always have been, um, dating back to the first time people realized that orbital debris could be a problem. But until recently, people would have said, in fact, I've read a pair of master's theses on this, how it's just not economically viable to do that. And I can't say I know everything about uh, MEV's financials, but they did it more than once. So I'd say there's at least some incentive there. Um, I think you'll you'll see it happen. You'll see these kind of things start to be implemented, especially as more attention goes into the space economy, which is, which is what's happening now. And I think which is part of the reason why there's so much interest in the conference like this and the topic like this at the conference. Does that make sense? Yeah. So switching over to Stephanie and Anna, um, what are the benefits you see of exploring and expanding digital printing on the moon for? applications on Earth or on other planetary bodies? 
Yeah, so when we do uh, 3D printing on the surface of the moon, um, not only does it advance the 3D printing technology for the moon, but it helps uh, look at 3D printing here on Earth. So we actually looked, did a case study on that earlier um, last year um, and looking at the kind of financial breakdown of it and how much it would cost and the financial breakdown of it. Um, and looking at how we develop regolith. So regolith is just pretty much a fancy term for dirt on the surface of the moon. Um, and there's different mineral compositions. The hardest part um, on the moon is there's a finite amount of water. So we would manipulate the concept of it, the formula for the concrete to reduce the amount of water. So you could uh, take these 3D printers, which are easily movable um, and take them to different countries. We could take it to like a third world country and be able to manipulate the chemical formula to be able to build houses right after like a natural disaster. Or like if there are natural disasters here on earth, we could hurry up and have quick, maybe they're temporary houses, maybe they're permanent. Still would have to figure out the logistics for that completely. So you'd be able to build up houses really quick just to have temporary. Do you have anything to add? I would say that's a pretty good explanation. I'll probably add uh, the supply chain uh, logistics. So with COVID, we saw that sometimes if there's an issue or um, for instance, uh, transportation boat gets locked in, uh, then that could uh, profoundly impact people's lives. And the way 3D printing, or at least with construction and other, not only now I'm thinking about other applications from maybe medicine, maybe essential uh, basic needs uh, in the case of natural disasters. Uh, so what that would do is decentralize uh, the supply chain. And so it makes it more resilient because you could delocalize it. And I think that's a very important uh, contribution as well as the integration of uh, the fourth uh, industrial revolution technologies. They could all uh, be uh, used in uh, integrated within uh, 3D printing. And I think that will be huge uh, in terms of software development, artificial intelligence, and just uh, in advancing uh, kind of like a more efficient and also uh, sustainable uh, economy. So Jacob, following on that theme, you talked about how there were innovations in other fields that could uh, lead to that uh, facilitating the uh, on-orbit refractory model, things like on-orbit servicing, so you don't have ancillary benefits. So thinking beyond your proposal, what are the benefits that could come from the on-order recycling model that would have other benefits, both in space and around? Uh, well, of course, uh, in space manufacturing is a very big thing. We're not going to be able, okay, um, and, Christoph and uh, ooh, Carl Sagan's Pale Blue Dot, he talks about how we're going to get to Mars. And he talks a lot about Christopher Columbus and the exploration of America. And uh, he mentions it, did, it didn't take one boat. It took a fleet of boats. There was three, and then there was more. And they didn't just send one boat over to the ocean. They, had a, they needed a whole fleet. So unless we have some sort of infrastructure in space, uh, before we start with these absolutely incredibly uh, difficult journeys like Mars or the moon or anything else, we really need to have some sort of infrastructure in space to be able to repair um, and service these craft before they leave to fuel them to uh, you know make, allow for proper uh, to, to fill them with food to do all of the things that need to be done including anything last minute before these fleets it's not going to be one starship it's going to be several fleets go to other places to colonize other places uh, now back on earth I, I can't stress it enough. Uh, we've got some some real garbage issues. The garbage is everywhere. It's absolutely everywhere. It's in the it's in the oceans. Uh, they're they're doing this great uh, Pacific garbage patch cleanup thing. I don't remember his name, but he's like twenty years old, and he's been pulling all of this garbage out of the ocean. And and he, it's an amazing amazing thing. Uh, but it's it's uh, it's it's even more than that. And it's very hard to convince people to stop making uh, uh, disposable razors or to stop making uh, plastic, uh, uh, plastic, oh my goodness, sorry, um, packaging. Uh, and it is very hard to tell America to recycle. They're not just gonna do it. 
It has to happen. And it's not even America's fault. It's not your fault that you're throwing away your stuff. You shouldn't be held accountable. It, it's not your problem. This is what you were trained to do. Uh, so the focus has to come on industry. You want to see things recycled? Industry has to recycle it. It's their responsibility in the first place. And this will put the technology in their hands to be able to do it. All of a sudden, you don't have a recycling bin. You just throw your garbage out, just like you used to do. And industry, with massive technology from projects like this, will take care of it. Uh, a lot of that has to do with, uh, if you've ever been to the airport, I don't know if any of you ever have, uh, you go through uh, security, you go through a TSA scanning thing. Now, when you go through the TSA, you put your luggage on the carousel and an x-ray shows you, shows, well, the TSA employee, what's in your bag based on color. If it's green, I believe it is for um, metal. If it's orange, it's organic. And then there's another, if it's blue, it's uh, plastic. All right. And then you have different shades of all of these colors. All right. And these sort of sorting techniques that are not currently in use in our uh, landfills uh, need to be improved on and need to be developed so that uh, we can sort and recycle garbage back here on Earth in an effective manner that doesn't uh, necessarily uh, force the problem on you. Thank you. So we have run out of time. And uh, I want to thank our panelists. That was a really engaging conversation. I appreciate all your time. You've given around the